class officially starts at 10.15, I'm told, but you're all here. <laughs> so don't tell anyone. I'm just going to go ahead and plow in. Is that okay? I, I appreciate your, your uh, <laughs> going to the uh, diligence to get here so early, and uh, I appreciate that very much. And uh, I don't mind an extra five minutes, so if nothing else, we'll have a little more time for conversation at the end. This is, as you know, a uh, study of the book of Revelation. I mentioned to you last week, it's actually a continuation of a series that I did five years ago, and I've been frustrated ever since that I wasn't able to finish it, so I'm finishing it now. And so if you're looking for it on YouTube, a couple of you two have asked about that, and you just have to go to Apocalypse and Space and Time and go to the bottom. Last week's was number 11. So it's just continuing, does that make sense? So if you're trying to find it or telling someone else about it, then that's the way to hunt it down. Last week, I was proud of myself, we covered three verses. <laughs> and this week, we're gonna cover three verses. So uh, I don't want any snide remarks in the back of the room to the effect, you know, at this rate, the second coming will happen before we're done with Revelation. Uh, we're going to uh, kick up the pace a little bit by next week, but we're still doing a, a certain amount of preliminary kind of introductory material, and so I'm excusing myself from a more rigorous uh, commitment to cover more material each week. And so this morning, I want to especially spend a little bit of extra time looking at the author and the timing of the authorship of this book. So that is what we'll do uh, to some degree as well as looking at the next three verses as well. The first eight verses of chapter one are really kind of the first package, you might say, of thought that we want to consider. Each line is important and we're looking at them in some detail as we go along. But what I'd like to do is give you right now the first eight verses, the the verses beginning at verse 4 are on the screen, but we'll actually start with verse 1 down to verse 8 of uh, Revelation chapter 1. This is the Word of God. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must take place right away. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who swears to everything he saw, to the Word of God, the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, for the time is very near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. Now to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be kings and priests to serve his God and Father forever, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he's coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, yes, even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the land will mourn because of him, so shall it be, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Revelation 1 through 8, and we'll pick up this morning at verse 4. Let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get going. Our Father, we're grateful for this announcement of truth. We're grateful that you have broken in to history which at times can seem so nonsensical and shed light on it such that we can have confidence and faith and hope and certainty and all of it because of the disclosure of eternity itself in Christ. And we give you thanks for it in his name Amen. All right, well, we start with reference to John. And of course, as soon as we mention John, there are two questions that pop to mind. They are separate questions, but definitely related. First question, who is he? Who is this character? 
That's the question of authorship. The second, when is he? Is he writing in an earlier date or a later date? The questions are related because if this is, as has been the traditional view, John the Apostle, then it at least presents an interesting challenge to assume that John the Apostle was the author around the year 95 AD. That would make him a pretty old guy. It would certainly make him in his 90s, maybe more, given that lifespans in the ancient world were a little shorter than they are these days, it at least has taxed the imagination of some to think that John the Apostle would have been the author of this book if it had been written in 95. And so that's actually led to a fairly well-known theory that it's actually not John the Apostle, but another character known as John the Elder. The Greek word John the Presbutero, John the Presbyterian, you know, that he was the guy who was there. And as much as I'd like to tie the authorship of this book to a Presbyterian, I tend to go with the former theory, and I'll talk about that a little bit more as we go along. But you can see the problem. If the date is 95, it, it's not impossible, and some would still insist that John the Apostle could have been the author of this, and that's certainly conceivable, but it does at least raise that issue. For what it's worth, virtually the universal view of the early church was that John the Apostle was the author, and so those that ad address it, not everybody does, but the fathers who actually address the question tend to take it for granted that John the Apostle was the author. So that includes uh, Justin Martyr writing around the year 150, uh, Irenaeus writing around the year 180, Clement of Alexandria around the year 200, Origen of Alexandria 230, and certain others make passing reference to this. And there's not, not everybody, but at least the majority view would uh, safely be that John the Apostle is the author of this book. Some have raised the question, how could John the Apostle be the author when the differences are so staggering between the style of Revelation and the style, for example, of the Gospel of John or the three letters of John? And certainly anyone, just a casual reading, is going to be persuaded that there is a conspicuous difference. It has been noted, however, by some who've looked at this closely, that though there are stylistic differences, there are also some substantial parallels. One said John's style in Revelation is quite different from his style in the Gospel, but much of the vocabulary is common to both and often unique to him. So even though we have stylistic differences, in a surprising number of cases, words are used by John that are not normally used or even at some times ever used by any other authors. One such word we mentioned last week was semeon, the word for sign. If you know the Gospel of John, you know that John organizes the Gospel around signs. When Jesus turned the water into wine, this sign, this first sign, John says, was performed by Jesus in Cana of Galilee. And other texts through John's Gospel make reference to Jesus performing signs, which are, of course, intended to point to the greater reality of his true identity. Revelation has the same kind of thing, a strategic use of that particular word, just for example. A great and marvelous sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head, Revelation 12, you see. Another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. A sign appeared in heaven, seven angels with the seven last plagues. John uses that same word. And even though stylistically it's different, you'd have to say that the strategic use of that word suggests similar authorship. Well, on multiple occasions, we're going to find things like that. And I'll try to highlight them as we go along. It at least becomes a, uh, part of the case we would make that John the Apostle is likely the author. The more ticklish issue, however, is when did he write it? I think you know that there's two theories. I alluded to this last week. The first theory, the most common theory, I'm gonna frankly acknowledge the majority view, though it's not my view. I'm always happy to be in the minority that got it right. But uh, in this case, I want to have the cards on the table. The majority view has been intended to be, tends to be to this day that the later date is the correct date. 
This would put the writing of this letter under the reign of the emperor Domitian. Domitian ruled from 81 to 96. Interestingly, after the Jewish wars, which were largely over uh, around the year 70 or soon thereafter, the Christian movement appears to have entered into a period of time that was dominated by a rather peaceful and tranquil circumstance. They'd been beleaguered for some time, and then it was almost like breaking through into the blue. And for about a generation, 25 years, Christian people, at least as far as we can tell, lived in, in relative peace and were able to go about their business and so on until Domitian. And Domitian, in the year 95, toward the end of his reign, launched a fierce but quite brief persecution of Christian people. It only lasted a few months, and it was like a kind of a jolt, you know, because this was somewhat unexpected. But he began to perceive the Christian movement as a threat to the uni unity of the empire, because you have these people running around saying things like, Christ is Lord, in contrast to Caesar is Lord. That was the difficulty. And so he launches this persecution. After that, which was fairly brief, another time of quiet till the reign of Trajan, which comes about 20 years later. Well, some have thought that John must have written during the reign of Domitian, and the chief argument for that is a statement that's made by Irenaeus. So Irenaeus, writing in about the year 180, makes this statement. This is in his Against Heresies. I, and I'm reading this to you verbatim because this is, I think it's safe to say, the chief piece of evidence for the late date, at least in terms of external evidence. So that's why it's rather important. Uh, quote, we will not, however, incur the risk of pronouncing positively as to the name of Antichrist. For if it were necessary that his name be distinctly revealed in this present time, it would have been announced by him who beheld the apocalyptic vision. For that was seen no very long time since, but almost in our day towards the end of Domitian's reign. Okay, so there's the statement. Not exactly a model of clarity, and I want you to know that in Greek it doesn't help any. But it was at least taken to facially suggest, even by his contemporaries, that Irenaeus took the view that Revelation was written under the reign of Domitian. There have always been those in history who have questioned whether that's what Irenaeus was actually saying. And in fact, in more modern years, this text in Greek has been, believe me, examined with meticulous detail and I'm not going to tell you about it because I don't like it when eyes glaze over like that in class. So I want to say this to you. If you are really interested in this, if you would really like to plumb the depths of Irenaeus' statement in Greek on this subject, you need to get a life. <laughs> but if you really want to, I do have material I can give you and recommend to you that'll take you right through every infinitive and every ver I've read it. I'm convinced that at best, this is not a definitive, conclusive statement. And it may very well be that Irenaeus did intend to say this, but he certainly didn't say it artfully enough to make it compelling. But anyway, it did kind of carry the day. And the fact of the matter is, this is the chief argument. The fact is, from this point on, it was sort of casually taken for granted that Irenaeus got it right, and so you do have a majority that take this view, but at least for my money, I'm not so sure that that's quite the uh, way we should think about it. In any event, when we look at the waterfront, as it were, of the people who adopt this late date, I think it's fair to say that they can be classed into one of two kinds of, and I'm thinking of professional scholars now, two kinds of scholarly uh, uh, students of this uh, whole question. One would be those who are more in the sort of critical and liberal side of Christian scholarship, who really have much less interest, for the most part, in proving the truthfulness of the Scripture. They're quite willing to admit and allow and even state that the Bible got it wrong, that things are not quite as you know, purported in this biblical text. And so you've got that branch of scholarship, and for the most part, they take the late date view. 
The others who take the late date are much more conservative, much more evangelical, much more concerned about protecting the integrity and the truthfulness, and indeed in some cases the infallibility and inerrancy of the Bible, and they also in many cases take the late date. But they deal with the issues in a somewhat different way, you see, as you can imagine. So as to the former of these, one of my favorite, somewhat liberal scholars, I rely on him, I like him, I think he's very fair to the text, even though I don't embrace the theological perspective that he endorses, but he says this, this is T.F. Glosson writing in the Cambridge Bible Commentary, his commentary on Revelation. He says early in it these words, quote, there can be little doubt that John believed the whole of his prophecy would be fulfilled in the near future. Glosson is on very safe ground there because that's exactly what John says. And the language John uses really doesn't leave much wiggle room as to that, and I was trying to labor that point somewhat last week. Now, Glosson, having said that in the same context, then frankly acknowledges the following, assuming the late date. Quote, the writer says he is speaking of, quote, what must shortly happen, verse 1-1, and we must frankly admit it did not happen. The various events and woes outlined did not develop in the way John expected. He's honest, given the perspective he assumes. He knows what John says. He looks at history. He says, didn't happen that way. Now, he gives John the benefit of the doubt. How could he know? He's doing his best, took his best shot. It's a powerful book. We should read it. We should listen to it. We should benefit from it. But let's not labor under the delusion that John got the right answer here as to at least what was going to take place in the immediate future, because nothing like what is described in Revelation could be correlated to the history that followed from the persecution of Christians in 95. So far, so good. You kind of see what's going on there. Well, the conservative types tend to take the view that Revelation is describing events stretching way out into the future. The historicist view says that it's describing events unfolding over centuries. And so we can see the rise of Islam in Revelation. We can see the Reformation in Revelation. We can see this or that great events in Revelation. That's the historicist view. The futurist view, which I know many of you are familiar with, would say that Revelation is largely describing all those events that will take place at the end of history. And often they make the case that we're living at that time in history, of course. We are in those end times, you know. Both of them immediately run into a huge problem because John in the first three verses says twice, these things are just about to happen. So how do you get around that? Well, the way usually is just to say, well, that's not what John meant. That's about the only way you can put it. Frankly, in my humble opinion, that doesn't explain those verses, it denies them, you see. But that is kind of the way that that problem is dealt with. It just doesn't mean right away. It may have sounded like that, but that's not, that can't be John's intent, because obviously it didn't happen right away, therefore it must be happening later in history. Okay, I think you'd say that if you looked at these two, groups, you would cover most of those who take the late date. Glosson, speaking of those who try to push the events out into the future, makes the following comment, quote, it's difficult to accept this view, that is a kind of futurist approach to Revelation, because the book speaks so emphatically of matters which, quote, must shortly happen and looks for the return of Jesus in the very near future. And while I think Glosson is correct with respect to the text, especially if interpreted in terms of 95 AD, I think if he had looked at it more seriously with respect to the earlier date, he might have actually reached a different conclusion. Well, the alternative is the early date. There have always been those in church history who have believed that John is actually writing Revelation under the influences of the persecution that was launched by Nero. I mentioned to you last week, I used to follow the late date. This was when I was young and foolish, you know, years ago. And then I heard a series of lectures by Earl Palmer, beloved, wonderful pastor, scholar, University Press, and he just rattled my cage. And I thought, wait a minute, that can't be right. And began to look at it way back then and became convinced that he was right. 
And in so stating it, he was actually joining a minority, but a robust minority of scholars who were also arguing for that. And really since the time uh, Earl Palmer made that case, not that he was the sole influence here, but uh, there's been a growing number who have taken this view and I think argued for it with some degree of fierce, compelling uh, persuasiveness. If it is true that Revelation was written more along the lines of 65 rather than 85 or 95, then it puts Revelation in a family of books in the New Testament that were also apparently tied to that rather difficult time in the history of the early church. Books like 1 Peter, who speaks of the persecution, the fiery persecution that's coming against us. Books like, the, uh, like Hebrews, who warns Christian people from abandoning their faith under persecution to go back to their uh, traditional Jewish understanding. Mark is undoubtedly written during the period of this uh, persecution under Nero, possibly 1 John. The point is, at this point, Revelation kind of joins the ranks of other books in the New Testament that are being written against a similar uh, troubling backdrop. And so again, it makes it more part of the New Testament, you might say. If you take the early view, as I do, then it implies, suggests, and rather demands that what's being described in Revelation is not the collapse of Rome, which the late date would assume, but is the collapse of Jerusalem, which is what the early date would almost universally assume. And in fact, if you match the cataclysms that are described in Revelation with what actually happened in history, leading up to the utter destruction, the raising to the ground of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, not one stone left upon another, cannibalism, famine, death, hardship, horrific, awful circumstances, you would say Revelation in some ways understated it compared to what actually occurred in that. So uh, that is the approach I take. There have been those who've tried to be in both positions. I very much uh, appreciate and respect Josephine Mazingbird Ford, now deceased, wonderful New Testament scholar at Notre Dame. She wrote as part of the Anchor Bible series, a, a Revelation commentary, and she took what amounts to a hybrid approach. She frankly acknowledged that parts of Revelation have to be tied to the early date. They have to go with, it doesn't make sense otherwise, and she makes a compelling case. But then she says, she thinks a second edition came out. It was kind of a revamp, updating it for the persecution under Domitian. You know, I'm not opposed to that, actually. And she makes a pretty good case, but I, fr I don't think it's necessary to have this kind of first edition, second edition approach. I think the whole book can actually safely be tucked into that first time frame. So I even, I'll rely on her. You'll hear me quote from her from now and again as we go through. I like a lot of what she says. But again, I don't think we need to go that far to have two editions of Revelation to make it make sense. All right. That's all I want to say on that topic. Um, so uh, I'm not going to keep apologizing every week for the approach I'm taking. I'm going to assume it, uh, and, and I hope that that is satisfactory from your point of view. But the approach we're going to take is, number one, John the Apostle is the author of this book. Number two, that he's writing against the backdrop of a persecution launched by Nero. Number three, he is giving assurance to Christian people who were under his care in those seven churches and then throughout the Roman world, Christian people everywhere eventually got this book, giving them assurance that though things were tumultuous and it seemed that the whole world was sort of up for grabs and falling apart, not only in Jerusalem but throughout the Roman world, that nevertheless those things had to take place, hang in there, God is ultimately going to vindicate you and his purpose in history. And so I'm going to take that as a kind of a frame of reference for the way in which we work our way through the book. All right. Going on from there, John says he's writing to the seven churches in Asia. This is the Roman province of Asia, not the continent of Asia. It is what we would sometimes call Asia Minor. And there at that time in history, there were seven major cities that kind of formed a mail route. It was kind of a horseshoe-shaped arrangement, and so as people would deliver mail 
from one city to the next, they would visit each city in the order that they are listed there in Revelation. These are specific, real, existing congregations in real existing cities at the time. This is not make-believe, it's not Uncle Remus. These are real people living in history. And the information included in the letters that we'll look at, of course, later uh, in this series, uh, really assume the churches exist in the form that they actually did exist uh, at that time in history. Uh, C.I. Schofield, early in this century, published his very widely read and, and highly influential Schofield Reference Bible. Some of you own one, as I do. And uh, you may uh, remember that Schofield argues the seven churches are actually describing the unfolding story of history, and each church stands for an era in the history of the church. And of course, he makes the argument, therefore, leading down that we're living in the so-called Laodicean age, the age of the lukewarm church. And he looked at the church of his day, 1920, said it was completely lukewarm, therefore it proved his case kind of deal. I'm overstating that a little bit, all due respects to C.I. Schofield. But uh, I, I, frankly, I don't think that flies. There's no textual suggestion that that's exactly how we should read these. I do think this, the lessons that are addressed to those churches apply to all Christian people at all times in history. I think here at First Presbyterian Church in Spokane, we have a little representation of all seven of those churches and their strengths and their weaknesses. And that what we should be doing, and as we live and move in, a, in the Christian world, we should be looking for the ways in which various expressions of the Christian movement can be celebrated on the one hand for the virtues we find in those churches and criticized on the other for some of the problems that are as well suggested. So that, I think, is the right way to view those, and we'll look at that more closely. Really at the heart of this whole section is this benediction. It begins, grace and peace. We, of course, are familiar with that language in the New Testament, grace and peace. The way it's framed here has a distinctly Trinitarian kind of flavor to it. Again, uh, Professor Glosson says this, notice the reference here to the Trinity. The Father is referred to in the words, him who is and who was and who is to come. Jesus Christ is directly named. The Holy Spirit corresponds to the seven spirits before his throne. The Holy Spirit is regarded here not so much in his personal unity as in his manifold energies. Just as light being one does not yet in the prism separate itself into seven colors. I think I misread that, sorry about that, but uh, you get the point. He's saying that there is one Holy Spirit, but kind of like light can separate into the colors of a prism. We have something like that with this reference to the seven spirits of God before his throne. Some have thought those seven spirits are actually seven angels that are mentioned elsewhere in Revelation before his throne. The problem is, in the Bible, grace and peace never come from angels. That's an attribute of what deity does for us. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ is a standard refrain in the New Testament. You never hear of angels doling out grace and peace. And so it again argues, this is truly a Trinitarian formula that we have going on here. The order, however, in which the Trinity is mentioned interestingly corresponds to the structure of the temple and before that the tabernacle. Now this is a little subtle and I'm not going to push it too hard, but the fact is as we go through Revelation we're going to find that the temple structure is presupposed in many different places. I'll try to highlight this as we go. It suggests, number one, the temple was still standing, but more importantly, it suggests to us that this whole story is taking place, in a sense, in the context of worship. Revelation is, in some sense, a celebration of a great worship service. And though it has a lot of tumultuous stuff going on, the broader frame for the whole thing is constant worship. Again and again, chapter after chapter, we hear of voices praising God. Great songs of praise coming once and again throughout the book, as if to say this whole, thing, this whole thing is kind of a worshipful sort of expression taking place in this temple. When we think of God the Father, we think of the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant. When we think of the Spirit, we think of the lampstand in the holy place fueled by oil 
which is often a symbol of the Spirit. When we think of the sun, we think of the outer court, the brazen altar, which was the place of sacrifice where the blood was shed and atonement was achieved. And so we have this kind of Trinitarian arrangement, although not in the order we normally think of the Trinity. When we hear of the Father, he's described to us as the one who is and who was and who is to come. That's an expansion, as you know, of the Old Testament proper name for God, Yahweh, given to Moses at the burning bush as I am. It's a remarkable idea, and it's way above my pay grade. I'm not even going to try to extrapolate the meaning of that, except to say to you that doesn't it really give a a mysterious but deeply satisfying answer to the most fundamental question of human life and existence. This is the one who was, who is, who is to come. He's in a sense outside of it all. Sometimes people try to make arguments for the existence of God and make God the conclusion at the end of a syllogism. I think it's more correct to say we wouldn't even have syllogisms but for God. God is the major premise behind any syllogism that works. We start with God. We don't conclude God, as Descartes tried to do. You see, God is before all of that. He is the reality necessary to explain everything else, and yet in some ways he himself is unexplainable and escapes all of the words we would like to use to try to put him into some sort of container. So we leave it at that. This is the great eternal being who is the source of all of this. Great comfort to those who heard John announcing this. And then we hear of the seven spirits, presumably a reference to the Holy Spirit, certainly an allusion to Zechariah's prophecy. If you're familiar with Zechariah, you know that he's one of the later prophets in the Old Testament. He's writing to people who have just returned from 70 years of exile, and it ain't looking so good in Jerusalem. The walls are broken down, the temple has been laid waste, the whole city is kind of a mess. When they start going to work to rebuild the temple, some of them are just floored at how simple, how unglorious it is compared to the great temple that some of them actually recall, Solomon's temple. It just all seems as if this is a useless exercise. And both Haggai and Zechariah write, prophetic words to encourage them. Zechariah says, as part of his encouragement, a message that's contained in seven night visions, as they're called. One of them is a vision of a lampstand. And in the lampstand, he says, or about the lampstand, he says this, I'm looking and there's a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it, and on the stand, seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl, the other at its left. What Zechariah is saying to the people of his day is, look, I know it doesn't look real pretty, but you're forgetting the Holy Spirit is at work here. This oil is coming from two great olive trees, therefore it is a perpetual supply, it's never going to dry up, and so these lights are going to keep burning. Zechariah says, virtually in the same context, don't despise the day of small things. I know this looks like small stuff. I know this isn't the glory you once saw, but hey, God's Spirit is at work here. And by the way, Zechariah also says, it's not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit. Zechariah is arguing for the potency of God's Spirit and the limitless supply of His Spirit to those people in that day. And it's been, I think, rightly understood that in some ways, this is what John is saying. The sevenfold Spirit of God, in a sense, is reminding these churches that though they are beleaguered, the same Spirit that has been with God's people through history is in fact available to them and is feeding their need and sustaining them and giving them strength even in the face of the difficulties that will challenge them soon enough. These seven spirits are said to be before the throne of God. The term, the throne of God, or the throne, is used 46 times in Revelation. 46 times. Only four chapters don't mention the throne of God. The people of God are being constantly reminded that God is inhabiting a throne. 
a place of sovereign authority, and that's supposed to give them some degree of comfort. The picture that you see here is one artist's attempt to capture the throne as described in chapter 4, which we'll eventually look at. The 24 elders, the four living creatures, they're all there. It's one good effort, I guess. I couldn't do it, but uh, nevertheless, you get the idea. That throne room is constantly brought back to our memory throughout Revelation. Again and again, we're reminded of it. And of course, the point of that is to tell these people that even though life is bumpy, God's throne is not threatened by any of it. So we have God the Father. We have God the Holy Spirit. God the Father, unfathomable, in some ways distant, unknowable, and yet brought to us in the most personal, intimate level of knowledge through the Spirit indwelling us, feeding us the living water that Jesus speaks of, given to us by the Spirit. And then the last reference is to Christ, the culminating reference in this Trinitarian benediction, because this is, after all, the revelation of Jesus Christ, as we saw last week. And so this is from Jesus Christ, who is said to be the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. He's the witness, he's the firstborn, he's the ruler. You may know the term, technical term, munis triplex. It's a theological term, and it's the term that's been used traditionally to describe the threefold offices of Christ that we find described throughout the Bible, Old and New Testaments, namely that Christ is prophet, priest, and king. You've all heard that. And that munis triplex is a reference. The threefold, as it were, municipality or the offices of Christ. Interestingly, the description we have here matches precisely the munis triplex. So first of all, we hear that Christ is the faithful witness. The Greek word for witness is martyr. It's genitive here, so it's martus. It's the same word, and it means he is a witness, and the word usually meant someone who was a witness in court giving testimony under oath. And it was especially an important word when it was connected with a capital crime. Now, we hear the word martyr, and we think of someone who dies for some just cause or some, uh, some virtuous cause, a martyr for the cause. We think of it that way. And sometimes you wonder, how did the word martyr shift from the meaning of being a witness to the meaning of being someone who dies for some just cause? The answer is a bit of irony because there was a kind of colloquial use of the word that came to be applied in which a martyr, a witness, would go to court and give false testimony with the intent of having an innocent person accused and executed. Now, there were grave penalties for doing that, but it did happen. And that would happen sometimes, and thus a person would go to court and be a martyr and as a, as a matter of fact, as a result of their testimony, an innocent person was put to death. And the colloquialism that came to be applied to them was that person was martyred. Does that make sense? Kind of a, you know, those of you who are old enough, which probably is most of you, remember the term someone got borked? Remember that expression from way back then? The same idea, you know. The way that Robert Bork was treated in his uh, uh, nomination hearings in the Senate uh, it came to be a term that was used. Oh, the guy got borked, you know, or would be borked. Or well, it's this, he got martyred, meaning he got executed based on false, fabricated testimony. It could be the most uh, astonishing example of that was Christ himself, who was, of course, executed based on the testimony of false witnesses in part, executed, nevertheless, for the greatest of all causes, and thus, somewhere along the line, that word kind of switched its meaning, and that's why we think of a martyr as someone who dies innocently and usually in some just effort. So he's the martyr. Jesus is the faithful witness in both senses of the word. And we might leave the story there. We might just relegate Jesus to the history books of another person who tragically ended his existence in a great, heroic, attempt to make the world a better place, but 
didn't work out that way. As many others have been martyred in history, but the one exception to the rule that is represented by Jesus is that he's also the firstborn from the dead. So he doesn't stay in the tomb. He doesn't remain there as if that was the end of the story. He was a martyr for sure in both senses of the word, but his witness was fully vindicated when on the third day he rose again from the dead, and thus his martyrdom was not the last act. His resurrection is tied to his priesthood. Remember we said prophet, priest, and king, because his resurrection is in fact the culminating expression of his priestly service. The writer to the Hebrews says, Jesus did not enter the most holy place to offer the blood of bulls and, and lambs, animals, but he says he went into the most holy place with his own blood. So here's the priest who is at the same time the sacrifice. The priest who walks in bearing the lamb that is in, sa in fact himself. That's the imagery that we find here. But how would we know that that offering was effective? How would we know that God accepted that blood? The way we know it is because God screamed the vindication of his son on the third day when he raised him from the dead, and thus the priestly work of Christ was fully vindicated, and we can say with confidence he is prophet, priest, and king. And of course, his resurrection becomes the guarantee of ours. Paul famously says, we sing this every year in the Messiah, 1 Corinthians 15, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man came the resurrection of the dead. As in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. And so we cling to the resurrection because it not only says something of Christ, but it says something of us and our own secure circumstance in his care. Well, having been the prophet, having been the priest, 40 days later he stood before his disciples and he said to them, all authority has been given unto me. All authority. All authority in heaven, all authority on earth. The whole sweep of authority in this universe has now been handed to me because I have earned the right to be the ruler of the kings of the earth. We in the evangelical world of American Christianity, which has been heavily influenced by pietism, tend to view the rule of Christ in somewhat mystical or personal terms, as if, well, he's the ruler in my heart. And that certainly is the case and ought to be the case, but it doesn't stop there. And if you look through the history of the church, you'll find that there's a vastly more robust idea associated with Christ being the king. He's the ruler of the kings of the earth. And oh, by the way, that includes presidents, prime ministers, senators, house of representative types, despots, dictators, uh, you know, you name it. Whether they acknowledge it or not, they are beholden to King Jesus for how they discharge their duties. And this is what the church has affirmed with a rather vigorous kind of confidence down through history. I'm reading here from William Symington, who's writing in 1839, a classic work called Messiah the Prince. Commenting on this verse, he says this, quote, the persons who are here supposed to be subject to Christ are kings, civil rulers, supreme and subordinate, all in civil authority, whether in the legislative, judicial, or executive branches of government, of such Jesus Christ is prince, ho archon, the ruler, lord, chief, first in power, authority, and dominion. We as God's people believe that the simple formula for salvation is that you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. That means ruler of the kings of the earth, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. And so all of this packages for us a remarkable insight into the character of Christ. John Calvin loved the expression, the crown rights of King Jesus, and he believed that that warranted Christian people to do anything they could in allegiance to the authority of Christ, even if it put them in crosshairs of civil government or those who take their stand against the Lord and against his anointed.
Glasson once again says, Christians at this time were a helpless minority at the mercy of brutal Roman persecutors, but running through this work is the conviction that in reality the lordship of the universe belongs to our Lord and his Christ. This is shown pictorially in chapter 5 in the vision of the Lamb. All right, this brings us now to the kind of concluding benediction. To him who loves us, this is warm, poignant affirmation. Jesus loves me, this I know. How do I know it? The Bible tells me so. This is a good example right here. You didn't believe it. To him who loves us. God, in his essence, is this distant, unknowable reality we can barely imagine. And yet, somehow, this reality stepped into human history, walked up to you, put his finger on your nose, and said, I love you. And what in the world does that do for the human spirit, to know that somehow we are connected to the great creator of all things through one who announces he loves us? He is the one who has freed us from our sins, the guilt of our sins, the bondage of our sins. This is, by the way, an allusion to the Exodus and the Passover where the blood is sprinkled on the lintel and on the doorposts, liberating the people of God from Egypt. The blood, as it were, was the key to their liberation. But he also made us kings and priests, which is another allusion to the Exodus. Because after Moses took the people of God out of Egypt, he took them to Sinai, and amounts to the, uh, announced to them in chapter 19, among other things, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. To put it in our vernacular, God was making Israel pastor to the nations, the pastor nations. The nation of Israel was supposed to, as it were, build a church and say, y'all come. This is a house of prayer for the nations. There was nothing provincial in Israel at her best. Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way very often. Under David, we certainly see it. Under Solomon, we see it. But for the most part, Israel failed her responsibility, so much so that when Jesus came to Jerusalem during Holy Week, he pronounced a definitive judgment. The kingdom is taken from you. Sorry, guys. Given to another nation. Worthy of it. You forfeit this. It's now given to someone else. So that in a sense, what John is saying is you have become that nation. You have become the church for the world. You have become the one that goes to the world and says, y'all come. You're the one who is now in the business, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, of reconciling all things to Christ. He's given us, all things are of God, who's reconciled us to himself through Christ. He's given us this ministry of reconciliation. So, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Christ is the reason for this book, and the celebration and worship of Christ is the end product that it should produce in all of our hearts, and to that we can give a resounding amen. I think we should be aware that our liturgy as Christians celebrates all of this probably a lot more than we sometimes think. I was thinking about Isaac Watts writing in 1719, an heir of the Puritan tradition, believing with all his heart that Christ is ruling over the kings of the earth right now, and he was moved to sit down and write these words. Maybe you've heard them. Joy to the world, the Lord is come, let earth receive, let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room, because heaven and, nations, uh, heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Not someday, friends, not out in some future, and right now he's just sort of hanging around waiting for... No, he's reigning. This, we are in the kingdom of Christ because he established his, Christ, his kingdom in Holy Week 2,000 years ago, and that kingdom has been growing like a mustard seed into a great plant, into a great dominating presence in this world ever since, and the job isn't done yet. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. No more let sins and sorrows grow. How much sin and sorrow is in this world? And those two, by the way, are related. 
Just saying. Nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is ground. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness, the wonders of his love. And I'm uh, leaving that wonderful hymn with you as your Sunday school lesson this morning because I think we all know the words and it's not a bad idea to just kind of repeat those. And others like it. Jesus shall reign wherever the sun doth its successive journeys run. How much of our hymnity celebrates the reign of King Jesus? And the book of Revelation, whatever else it's about, is about reminding us of that great and wonderful truth. Well, thank you all. Let's, uh, let's close in prayer and we'll be dismissed. Our Father, we are grateful that you are indeed the one who is and who was and who is to come. And how can we fathom that? You are so much higher than we are that we can only make the most feeble efforts to imagine the majesty of your being. And yet you have come to us in Christ. And you have given us your spirit and you've become intensely personal. The great God of the universe living within us. How can we imagine it? But we thank you that we know it's true by faith we sense the truth of it every day as we greet a new day, knowing that your word is a light to us and your presence is a strength to us. And so for all of those reasons, we worship you and praise you and acknowledge you as God of gods, King of kings, and Christ as the ruler of the kings of the earth. And in all of that, we rejoice and give you thanks. 